Hello there, welcome to my new video for Against the Storm. In this one, I have collected 10 tips and tricks for advanced players who want to beat prestige layers 1 to 10 and beyond. So, it's a mixed bag of uh, different topics and I hope you'll find these helpful for you. Timestamps are down below and if you have any questions, ask away. If you have any strategies to add, I'm all ears. I'm very, very grateful if we have a useful comment section down there helping out people in addition to this video. That being said, let's get started with number one. I want to talk map modifiers because map modifiers are really, really important. I mean, with that, these uh, thingies up here. Pay close attention to them. They will define your game. And if you don't like them, you can re-roll them at day one by just abandoning the settlement and restarting. You won't lose time. You won't lose anything as far as I know. You'll just get a new set of uh, map modifiers. You can't just settle on the same spot again because the there there literally was no time passing. It's a little bit cheaty, probably depends on you, but there are a couple of map modifiers which I personally feel are currently either unbalanced or extremely unfun to play around. And if there's anything you hate, just reroll the map. You don't you're not forced to play that. I personally hate these alluring lights, for example, like. Uh, services to prevent people from dying that's way too much for me okay on to number two thoughts about drafting yeah drafting that's one of the harder parts of the game and it's an art in itself so here's a couple of thoughts that you will find helpful number one you don't need to draft you know you're not forced to draft at any time if you don't know what the hell you're supposed to draft wait a while play on and sometimes it's worth gathering up that amber for the reroll if you are just facing decisions that are just crap for your current situation. It's no shame to gather up the money for the reroll. Apart from that, your order with the uh, drafting should always be first up, try to secure yourself a supply of building materials and fuel and basic food. These are imperative. Once you have a couple of these, go for something some complex food buildings that are compatible for your building plan. And after that, check out for services like uh, guild, the guild house here and try to produce the uh, necessary ingredients. This is the ideal scenario. You'll never get the ideal scenario though. Quite often you will have an opportunity to grab a service building way too early or, or the a certain material comes to laid, whatever might be the case, you will always be improvising at the end of the day. This is one of the uh, one of the parts of the game where I personally feel like sometimes it even breaks your game without you having any say in it. So in a nutshell, try to draft in the order that I mentioned, but if it is not possible, try to guess what's the best decision given that uh, that priority order. And you will you will over the, to over the time, find your own style, you know? I personally think that every player has its has his own preferences, how he or she wants to win. So therefore, it's all about fuel, building materials, simple food, complex food, services. That's the order. Try to maintain it as good as possible. Good luck, you'll need it. So, number three is concerning orders. So, orders are, it's, uh, are their own bunch. And as you see there, they are quite similar to the uh, drafts, you always get a mixed bag and the question is how to, when to and what to. So first off, try to open up your, your orders only when your settlement is currently stable, not building any houses, not building any uh, any infrastructure, not beating any uh, glade event currently. Basically, these order packs are ideally opened whenever you feel like, yeah, I need a new challenge. That's the ideal moment. It's no shame to leave them closed up until then and get your other business finished. There's nothing worse in this game than rushing into these decisions when they don't uh, really bring you anything. When it comes down to the orders, my personal approach is always to check the rewards that I want and then check if I can't match the objective. I always go for this preference. I check out the rewards I want and then I try to fulfill the objectives. If I can fulfill the objective, I take the reward. I, I, I want less because at the end of the day, the real big reward of every order 
is that one juicy point of reputation. Because basically, if you pick them right, you get for free here nine points of reputation that you will need to win. So choose your orders when you are free for work and choose them according to the rewards that are useful for you. Here it is all a matter of play style and the preferred things, but it's really like that. Also, a quick note on timed orders. They are always a risky gamble, but if you can't fulfill them, they are a real huge step forward. My personal favorite approach for timed orders is taking a risk in the early to mid game is totally okay for me because a game for me takes two to three hours. And if it is decided during the first 20 minutes because I bust myself up with a too risky timed order, that's that. Taking a risky timed order after I'm already two hours in and busting up my run like that, eh, well, I'm a bit of a conservative person. I just uh, want to say like how I feel like these things are. Okay, enough about that. Let's get on over to number four. That's consumption control. So consumption control is a wonderful tool that I think is really, really important to master. So here's a couple of thoughts. Whenever you have access to a processed food, for example, jerky, when you have that jerky in production, check out what kind of materials you are currently using in your city and then forbid the basic material, the basic raw food to be eaten. This way, you'll make sure that your folks will not waste the stuff to eat it when it's eaten raw and get well complex food multiplies food and it gives resolve bonus so you basically really do a bad job when they eat the food raw and you don't this is the only way to control what they're eating so it'll make people a little bit unhappy if you um, exclude too many um, services so excluding a certain type of food doesn't really do anything to them but if you'd exclude them from uh, for example, if we'd exclude the beavers from the cloaks, they'd be unhappy. Speaking about this, clothing and service uh, items. It is a wise choice to rationize them if you have a hard time surviving storms. So basically, if you are ever problem in a problematic situation facing storms and you have a service building and you can't produce the good yourself, buy yourself, for example, beer and forbid it here and only enable it during the storm season so your people can drink up and gather up some resolve during the problematic times. Either way, there are so many ways and means how you can utilize the consumption screen. I only mentioned the, a, a few corner points here. Utilizing this is making sure that your materials will be used most efficiently, and the later down the road you go, the more important this can grow to ensure victory. Now then, number five is a little bit less complicated, and it's about housing. So, first of all, try to have everybody sheltered at any point of the game. Sheltering is a super cheap way of making your folks happy. As you see here, sheltered gives plus three per se. No bigger costs involved. It's no shame to have just basic shelters at the beginning of the game, but as soon as you can get your hands on racial housing, there's uh, upgrades in the upgrade tree to have them permanently unlocked. High recommendation. But it's also worth drafting the uh, racial housing for your majority group. For example, in this scenario, I'd be totally down for drafting beaver houses. Unless I haven't unlocked them permanently, that is. And then spam the hell out of them. Try to have a racial housing for every single person in your city that is supposed to crank out reputation via resolve. Ideally, you get that for every person in the city, simply because it is, again, a super cheap ways and means to increase the resolve in your city. You shouldn't do it if you are under any way in a resource scarcity situation, but uh, for example, rushing some houses for the harpies never hurts to make them a little bit uh, happier. Housing is powerful. It's basically trading resource for permanent resolve, and you don't get resolve that cheaply too often in the game, especially permanent resolve. Resolve bonuses uh, go in waves uh, if you don't have a steady surplus production in this game. Housing is very steady and therefore very powerful. 
So number six regards trading. So we're going to hop on over to a different safe file for that. All right, over here, we got the trading better unlocked and the city is a little bit larger. So trading is a very, very powerful tool. I'm not only talking about the regularly incoming traders, I'm also talking about trade routes. So in case you weren't using this tool yet, I strongly recommend you to. Because in the beginning, these routes are not too profitable, you know, you have to build up some reputation. But the higher the standing, the more profitable these routes will go. And the more cities there are, the more potential you have for trades. Not only does this give you a lot of amber, there's a lot of cornerstones that will emphasize trading. There's cornerstones for hostility reduction for amber gain, for amber gain, resolve bonus for amber gained several different bonus for bonuses for um, standing. So all in all, there's a lot of win conditions behind trading. And I personally think those uh, trade routes are something you should practically use in every game when you are in it, because it's the it's a very, very cheap and easy way to get yourself some amber. And the best part about it is it is a ramping up source of amber. And amber is a real power tool. You can't have too much amber. Top it off with those win condition cornerstones. And uh, yeah, what can I say? It's just like one of the best things that I know of to uh, ensure victory. I personally love to draft the cornerstones that give you more um, benefits from from traded amber, but that's up to you. Here's just a quick word about the um, pro packs of provisions here. So. You might find them quite uh, hard to pick up because of the costs there. If you can't get your hands on herbs, they are really, really powerful because you cannot eat herbs raw. And per for me, they are the perfect uh, thing to be transformed into provisions. You can also keep an eye out for certain cornerstones that give you provisions whenever new people enter your town or whenever you open up new glades. These can be really useful, but in a nutshell, it is worth it to transform your raw food into provisions. It is, really. But don't do it if you have any any food scarcity. I'd time it personally. Trade comes for me always when I have my surplus of complex food. That's when I begin to establish trade routes for real. Before that, it can be risky. Sometimes it pays off. Sometimes it doesn't. It's up to you. There's no um, secure way to victory in the higher difficulty levels anyways. Now then... So we got this covered, so let's get on over to number seven. That's what I call the warehouse trick. So whenever I open up a new glade, a new danger glade, I smack a warehouse on top of it if I have anything to loot there. The reasoning behind that is quite simple. First off, 90% of the time the events have some something that, had, that has to be transported away and you want to have that in your warehouses. And the other point is, in this game, you can demolish every every piece of building, and you just get 100% of the of the building costs back. So, you know, time is money, you know that saying. And ensuring a short way for your people to gather stuff towards to is massive. A warehouse doesn't grow too costly, as you see here. It's just two bricks, two fabric, and a part, and it's so easy to pull it up. It will make your workers so much faster and uh, yeah you even get the investment back after you don't need it anymore it's like uh, sometimes I don't uh, build anything on the on the glade then I'll eradicate the warehouse afterwards or here for example we bought up a we brought up a mine here and uh, there's a tinctory now there so all in all we're going to use it so it stays also worth mentioning I try to have a warehouse in the vicinity of every hearth because hearths do require fuel, and a short distance between hearth and uh, warehouse ensures your fire keepers will always have their fuel on their hands. Warehouses are just like that for me. Okay, off to number eight. That's, you, you see it here, I want to talk about these paths. So, paths are powerful. It's just a five-person speed bonus for your people. Yes, but it's free. You just have to have one person building these, and that's what I want to talk about here as well. Keep one builder free at all times. I found that paid off so much. I personally try to have roads everywhere, and if 
if ever I don't have anything to do for my worker anymore, I put them into some workshop. But uh, it's seriously worth it to cook up those paths. You don't have to go for the paved or the reinforced roads. They are most of the time quite costly. But considering that there are even cornerstones that make road movement even more powerful, this, uh, this is really a powerful little tool that you won't really feel it in the immediately but it is one of those small bonuses which makes your life easier so we gotta hop on over to another settlement for number nine and there we go so number nine considers uh, the rain punk technology so rain engines they come in two flavors you can either boost production or you can boost resolve that's so far pretty clear but i personally love to get these guys going for storm season as you can see here your people will get a severe bonus to resolve so basically you can turn them on only during storm to give people a massive resolve bonus why is that cool sometimes you have those uh, scenarios where just one part of your population is hanging in the negatives and some buildings this one is a pretty bad example the more built the more worker slots it got the better because sometimes you can just park your people during the storm season there because you know storm season you usually unemploy those woodcutters to reduce hostility and then you can't park them in these buildings so basically this is a pretty nice way if you don't want to utilize it for productivity too much you can park problematic people in there so yeah rain punk uh, co rain collectors are powerful and this is one super simple way of using them for a crisis event if you don't want to da dabble into it too deeply but i highly recommend it's a pretty powerful tool so number 10 we're at the end of this video i want to talk at number 10 about win conditions you should have one win condition means that you should think about how do i want to win this game 90 percent of the time you can win your um, parties by your runs by bringing up enough complex food and then stacking up service buildings and win via a resolve uh, victory that, due to that because your people are so darn happy this is one way to victory that always works basically it's one generic way that you should always keep an eye on it's one that i highly recommend to follow if you have no other idea but there are a lot of keystones uh, cornerstone uh, things here that will allow you to go for a uh, different path. So, deserted caravans, global production is faster, but trading is unavailable, for example. That's a pretty cool thing. Um, give me a sec. Yeah, here, Exploration Expedition is also a wonderful example. So, this one gives you a minus 5 to resolve, which is bad, but plus frickin' 15 every time a new glade is discovered. So, this cornerstone is its own victory condition you just need to keep exploring your game will warp around this because your intention will be not about building up service anymore more about exploring in a sane way and keeping that bonus running during all the time so there are several ways and means to win this game it's up to you to find these uh cornerstones that give up that that make up a victory strategy i mentioned already previously in the video before that there are trade cornerstones i won several matches just by exporting like a madman and gathering up resolve like that and reducing hostility at the same time due to the fact that cornerstones can even be picked several times so they can be stackable you can even win harder once you have established a certain win condition all right that being said it's all about reputation just uh, try to gain reputation whenever you can that's the most important win, win condition and ideally i'd recommend you to try to incorporate a mixture of everything try to win via complex food and service but also try to send some boxes back to the citadel try to get yourself some reputation via these events try to get yourself a cornerstone to snack up something you know the more different approaches you can take that are synergistic with each other the better it takes a lot of practice though to find which stuff does work well together and which doesn't so that's the fun of the game that being said i thank you so much for watching i have no more to say about in this video i hope you enjoyed feel free to drop me a comment feel free to drop a thumbs up on that video 
and of course consider subscribing it'd be my pleasure so that being said have a wonderful day and see you back soon